that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Let me tell you something. I have studied the maps. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. <laughs> Just a catch of strays over here. <laughs> You're in for a hell of a show. Keep the faith. Hold the line and own the libs. It's time for our main... Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. Uh, we like to stir shit up on the regular here on the program. Uh, there's plenty of stuff to stir. Mm -hmm. this That's right. Week. That was truly <laughs> remarkable. She studied the maps, dude. Oh, my God. Uh, if you are someone who takes comfort in Kamala Harris studying the maps and, and, and producing military strategy, I'd like to hear from you. Frankly, you have an open seat here uh, vacated by Ashbrook again, right, Smug? Yeah, I mean, you know, I want to thank him for his time. He did a tremendous amount of help. <laughs> you know, help get us to this point. We thank him for his service. We just had creative differences. We wish him the best. <laughs> no, he, he, he's spending time with folks. We miss him. Can't wait to have him back. Yeah, no, it's uh, he's a very well-earned vacation where he's taking his children on a little spring break. Yeah. As one does when you're a normal human being here in the United States of America. Yeah. Um, but as a consequence, we're going to have to make do. Here yeah, we'll, 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 we'll carry on, soldier on the same way that Kamala yeah. is in the trenches. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> let's, let's talk about a very not normal human being. <laughs> yeah. And that oh, is our cats. vice president of the United States talking about how she's poured over the data. She's looked at the maps. I mean, the idea, Kamala Harris sitting there with like a map is there and anything, a compass. Is there anything more terrifying than thinking absurd. about that? Fucking absurd. Not just terrifying, just like absurd, an <laughs> absurd thing. It's like, you know what? I don't think anybody's looked at the maps in the Middle East. We need, uh, we need a pair of fresh eyes. You know what? I'd like Kamala? to give me the maps. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and study Rafa for us? I, I, I wonder if there's... <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's just such a, it's such an absurd thing to say. Like, may, may I remind her, the largest office building in the world, mm -hmm. it's called the Pentagon, right. and it's one mile south of where you are. Yeah. Kamala. Well, hey, well, we, no, can't, we no, can't figure this out. we got to bring in Kamala. <laughs> that's my thinking. It's like, imagine being in the Pentagon, and you get an email, and it says, like from the office of Vice President Kamala Harris. We'd like to drop by and take a look at the maps. Like the Joint Chief's office. We're like, what? <laughs> Are yeah. you for real? <laughs> and then Kamala Harris comes through with the staffer. And it's like, well... How, you know, are we going to get her like a coloring book? Yeah. What, like, yeah. what are we going to show her for like a map? They break out like a, like, a, like just, you want to play some Risk? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, can you imagine the, like the, the Star Wars bar that is the staff that follows her into that room, yeah. by the way? They bring her into the Pentagon and they give her one of those worksheets they give you at Applebee's <laughs> for the kids <laughs> oh with, the, with the coloring crayons. And it's like, hey, Kamala, if you can get through this maze, we'll show you the maps of Rafa. <laughs> She's like, I've seen the maps. Or like, actually, that was the Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> With cyber attacks on the rise, protecting your data security is more important than ever. So why is Congress considering a bill that puts your credit card data at greater risk of being hacked and exposed to foreign networks? The Durbin Marshall credit card bill shifts billions in consumer spending to less secure payment networks, all so that corporate megastores can make bigger profits. Don't let Durbin Marshall steal your data. Visit electronicpaymentscoalition.org and tell your senators to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. <laughs> Man, this is an Applebee's. <laughs> <laughs> but what's like not that funny is what she's doing. And we've said this on the program for now since October 7th. There is a constituency for Hamas within the Democratic Party. And what she's doing is trying to present that point of view to hesitant progressive Democratic voters within the administration. Yeah, we're, we're scrutinizing the activities of Israel's military and how they're conducting this war yeah. in Gaza. And we're, we're keeping a close eye on it so, you know, so they can reassure the Hamas coalition, sure. which is what I find so interesting over the, not just the, the administration, but also the media here over the last month or so, there's been sort of this tone shift away from which is a a, a horrible problem that's happening in Gaza right now, where the people of Gaza are basically being held hostage by a terrorist organization that has hostages. But we're not hearing about the hostages no. anymore. Uh -uh. It's not a conversation about hostages. Like, those Which, by the way, 
are innocent men, women, and children people who are being raped out yeah. in their homes. Yeah, people being raped and abused, and they've been there since October 7th. They were yeah. paraded through the streets and beaten, their legs broken. These women have been raped. We don't have a conversation about that anymore. Now it's a conversation about, you know, is the military of Israel conducting this operation in a dignified manner? And it's like that that removal of the consequences of the actions of terrorists on October 7th is is what our media and the Biden administration has has sought to do here over the last month. And I, and I separate this into two places where it, it there's one just like if you're a humanity if you're a bleeding heart humanitarian like you never like to see death and destruction. You probably shouldn't have voted for Hamas, mm -hmm. right? But anything that comes after October 7, you imagine is going to be devastating for people who did. I mean, that's an act of war the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. But then I put layer on top a second piece of this, which is what she's talking about and the motive for all that you're hearing out of the mainstream media and all of your hearing out of the Biden administration trying to triangulate this thing. Yeah. And, and that is an entirely political deal where they look at the numbers the same way that you all do and you see Donald Trump with a lead in all of these various states and then they look at their where they're softly performing. And they're softly performing with young progressives, regardless of age, race, demographic, like where it it's soft progressives. They're the the portion of their base that was like tearing down posters of women and children who've been kidnapped, that is such a vocal and, and large block of their support now at this point, they have to appease them. It's mm -hmm. wild. But um, imagine it. You know, look, I don't I don't want to draw the worst analogies because I think that's just bad in politics and everything else. But like, just imagine a scenario where a political party is reliant upon a demographic of voters who believe that what Hamas did on October 7th was justified. And then imagine that media doesn't scrutinize that. Like, who is it that you're trying to pitch to go vote for you? Mm -hmm. Like, is that the right thing to do as a leader of the United States of America, as a leader of the free world? Like, is that the right move? That discussion has never been a part of – you've not – other than the variety program right now, you've never heard this argument. Mm -hmm. You've never heard – like, is it appropriate for a president of the United States, much less an, an, a candidate for reelection – courting a voter that thinks that what happened October 7 in Israel was justified. Is that something we should tolerate in this country? Mm -hmm. Of course not. And, and you bring up a good point where they are trying to triangulate, they're trying to figure out where they can get their voters, their base voters, to support them on this. There's this hilarious clip. <laughs> yeah. Can we, can we, of Kamala Harris trying to do just this? Can we see that clip? This is in Puerto Rico. Is this clip one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's Kamala Harris emerging from a building for our audio only listeners, and there's chants from the crowd. Oh. Oh, and the clapping has started. She's clapping. So she's like clapping she's, along so she, and having a great time. And she's she's dancing and clapping along with the protesters who are they have this song chant. And, and then an aide runs up to her and is like, they're chanting long live free Palestine in Haiti, too. <laughs> <laughs> it General is a barbecue deserves our support. <laughs> it is the perfect microcosm of what is Kamala Harris. Bro, it's just it, like an episode of Veep. It really is. Yeah. It, it, I mean, like Selena, they are chanting "Long Live Haiti," and, <laughs> and she's like, bop, 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 having a great bop, time to bop, it. Bop, 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 bop. She's dancing around. She's loving. It. She's like, man, these people really love me. That's yeah. the thing is, she's like, oh yeah, they're super excited that the vice president, who no one wants to be president, <laughs> has come to visit them. Well, and they're specifically saying there in the chant, "We want to know, Kamala, what did you come here for?" And she's like. Oh, bop, 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 you're bop, here bop, for bop, me. Bop, exactly. Bop, 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 bop. And then long live free Palestine in Haiti, too. Yeah, you love it. You got to support General Barbecue. Yeah. I mean, holy smokes, just an absolutely incredible. Um, I Look, 
I look at all of this stuff from a perspective of what the Biden administration has deputized her for. Yeah. And what they've deputized her for, quite obviously, because they say it themselves. This is an article from MSN. Uh, Harris steps up her role as ambassador to voters shaky on Biden. Now, most of you would think about that, and you'd think about the 34% approval rating that the president has, and you would say, okay, well, it's got to be a center of the electorate deal that are upset about the economy, they're upset about the open border, they're upset about a whole range. No. 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 It's all base, baby. Yeah. It's all base. And what they're deputizing this woman to do is go out and do things like triangulate on Hamas, Mm -hmm. which is just striking, isn't it? I mean, so the way this article describes it is just, I mean, it's remarkable. It says, Harris has been thrust to the forefront of President Biden's efforts to hang on to young and minority voters. Groups are vital to his reelection, but that may be losing enthusiasm for his candidacy. Imagine being like, we've got to get young people energized. Who do we send? And the answer is Kamala Harris. Like, you are out of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just, are completely out of ideas. It's really tough. Like, that. Like, imagine you're a baseball team and, like, you got to bring in a closer to, <laughs> to win this game. And you're going to bring in. They start playing Enter Sandman, yes. but it's not Mariana Rivera. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna bring in Kamala, <laughs> Kamala Harris. Who's, and then Macaulay Culkin walks through the gates. <laughs> K- K- Kamala, Kamala Harris, <laughs> whose who's political acumen led her to dropping out of the primary before Iowa. Yeah. You know, like this isn't somebody who electrifies audience mm. or shores up bases of support. She had no base of support. She, no. had, she had tons of money. She had a great fundraising base in California and she couldn't even get to Iowa when she ran for president. So I do not believe she has great political instincts. But listen to this. This month, this is according to MSN here, uh, Harris has championed a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in Nevada. Mm. Oh, that's a good time. Mm. Good time for that. Yeah, Nobody's they, concerned about yeah. the border, so we <laughs> definitely need that. She's discussed marijuana legalization in the White House with rapper Fat Joe. Okay. This okay. is more hard hitting work. Yeah, because you know when you're worried about your national security and you're worried about the fact that you pay a, a, a million dollars for a bag of potatoes, like the the marijuana thing's top of mind, and call for a ceasefire in Gaza at a commemoration of Bloody Sunday in Alabama. What they're not noting in this article, which I noticed, was that they actually sent her in Minnesota into an abortion clinic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, think about how progressive this is. I mean, look, that's a well-defined issue. I think, like, we're eyes wide open on this. We have our views, obviously. Um, But as a whole, for the Republican Party, it's a net advantage for Democrats in a lot of these states. And it's shown that in both elections Mm -hmm. and polls. But to send her to an abortion clinic, that's very different than actually sending her out to talk about women's health or however they right. phrase it. It's a, it's a far way away from, like, safe, legal, and rare. That's right. I mean, that's, and that was the Clinton. That yeah. used to be it. The Clinton uh, Democratic orthodoxy was safe, legal, and rare, which carried their party to two successive elections with Bill Clinton and got them in the ballpark in a lot of different places. Now we're like, Sending the vice president of the United States to an abortion store, mm-hmm. and I, I, I love seeing the results. Wow. We, we can see the results of these efforts. Where uh, it says further in this article, a recent New York Times Siena College poll found Trump slightly leading Biden with Latinos by six percentage points. After 2020 exit polls showed Biden winning this group by 33, 33. points. I mean, that's a, a 40, forty point swing. Forty points straight up. I mean, you're dealing with 39 point swing amongst Hispanics in 22 exit or 2020 exit polls, black voters favored by Biden by 75 points, but a recent poll uh, showed at 43. It's basically like in half. And and I think that's the thing is is the key issues that matter to Americans when it's the economy, when it's safety, when it's an open border, when it's things that affect all Americans on a daily basis. And you've got there are, the the best idea for the Biden campaign is let's send Kamala to go clap with with people being like you know free Haiti like they are completely out of touch they're completely out of ideas. Well, I, but the thing is is that you look at this it, it, part of the reason you tune in for a ruthless variety program is just from this cynical operative point of view, and they know damn well that they're not going to have a forty three percent margin amongst black voters. 
the, the question, the only question is whether people vote. And there was a lot of motivation for them to vote uh, across all kinds of progressive demographics in 2020 because they just wanted Donald Trump out. And they've lost that motivation because, frankly, the guy's done nothing for them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whether it's— I, I, Everyone has seen Biden has made things far worse. It doesn't matter what group you're a part of, what income level, what ethnicity. Things are now worse than they were under Trump. And, and, and I think that is the issue and the center point that Biden can't run away from. I do think that there is marginal progress being made in the black community. I know there is massive progress being made in the Hispanic community. Huge. But, like, if you're a Republican voter and you're looking at these, like, four-point advantages in swing states that Donald Trump has and they count on a 40 percent drop in black support of of Biden, like, don't count on that. Yeah. Don't count on that. Because th- th- that campaign, the Biden campaign, is going to be focused on on bringing the base back. That's what and they're doing. You see these numbers when people are, are kind of uh, upset with the incumbent president. But— at the end of the day, it comes down to getting these people to show up to the polls. And, yep. and I think if things continue the way that they are, yes, it's going to be difficult, but you can't count on, like, home set. I mean, like, it's just not going to happen. Like, I it, I don't know how many t- times I need to tell people this. Like, you're making marginal impact. No yeah. question about the, it. The Latino outreach doesn't has mean been the extremely effort, effective. It, well, it doesn't mean the effort's not worth doing. It is. But like anytime you see these polls where you feel it's just collapse amongst a reliable Democratic demographic, it's never going to happen. Yeah, just don't count on it. You can't count on the collapse. Yeah. You can count on marginal improvement, mm-hmm. which I think we're well on our way. Um, all right. So we've got a great interview today. Uh, Moore Capito yeah. is running for governor of West Virginia. Young guy. I think a lot of you will relate to him and what it is that he cares about. Seems like his platform basically is like law and order. Like yeah. Come to West Virginia because we enforce the laws and you know you can leave your door unlocked like we did. Yeah, he's a heck of a salesman for the state. Too. It's really good. Yeah, it's good. It's actually really impressive. Yeah. It's almost like uh, Ashbrook for Cincinnati. Yeah. Well, don't give Ashbrook that much credit. <laughs> it's a little more grading when Ashbrook does it, as frequently as he does. <laughs> It's a little bit of that. Um, I'm about to give you a Hack Madness update. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we also have a Kareem Jean-Pierre interview. Yes. You have to hear to be believed here, and we have a lot to say about that. We're going to close the loop on the story about Ronna McDaniel and mm-hmm. NBC, and then we got some variety for you. We got, I mean, there's a good variety today. Yeah. yeah. Really good variety. We can jump. So first off, to jump into Hack Madness. Yeah, let's do it. So, folks, voting is underway. We've we've got like over 100,000 votes. Hell yeah. Last time I checked, and it's gone up since then. The first round is done. We're down to 32 people left. And by the time that you're hearing this, voting is underway to, to narrow that 32 down to 16. And, I mean, we've, we've, we've seen some expected wins, like Taylor Lorenz. You know, takes down Rian Joy Gray. I think the upsets are really where we should focus here, you know, in these big, like Nicole Hannah Jones taking down Yamish. Yamish has been a traditional powerhouse yeah. for an awful lot of years. Uh, he had a little lower profile this year, and I think that that upset was coming, didn't you? Yeah. Um, you, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones has had prolific output, even though you don't see it in actually putting articles out for the New York Times, which is supposed to be her job. Um, the interesting thing, right below that, you see Joy Reid beating Ben Smith, who Ashbrook thought <laughs> Ben Smith's a horrible hack, and he was like, I thought he would be. I love that you just sabotaged yeah, Smash face, every Facing a tough again. challenge. Well, I, I, the TV bias remains, fellas. It does. That's definitely for sure. The you TV see folks bias. who are on TV definitely getting more votes. You see folks who uh, appear on King of the Hill yep. uh, doing extremely yeah, well. Bill, Bill, Bill Crystal in an 11th seed. Upset over uh, Justin uh, Justin Baloney, whatever yep. his name is from Daily Beast. Yeah, yep. um, that was. Uh, I, I'm not surprised by it, but that was an upset. I think the one that surprised me the most, and I, I mean, I'm I sh- think you're going to say the same. Well, I also I, I took a flyer in my bracket yeah. on this one, and I I thought this would be the first time in Hack Madness history that we would have had a 16 seed yep. upset with Mika. Yeah, beaten Phil Bump. I really and it was close. I think it was like a fifty-one forty-eight point whatever yep. situation. 
But I had I had Mika going a little bit deeper there. I just would have thought with the TV bias that the tournament generally has and the takes that have been on Morning Joe have been just electric. I would have expected her to, to knock off bump there, but it didn't happen. No, I, I think part of this is what we've talked about in terms of trying to get listeners to a point where they actually appreciate the hackery Mm -hmm. of the print journalism and how it feeds cable news yeah and like phil bump is a perfect it is it it, it is well deserved that he won there's a reason why we seated him one right and there's a a reason why he they respond despite a formidable 16 seed Mm -hmm. i mean that look it makes a lot of sense to me boot moves on beat Alyssa farah uh which is i mean i was surprised by that too. Yeah, yeah. I usually, just, the TV bias helps. Yeah, like given her profile and and the view and that sort of stuff, I would have expected her to pull it out. But I well, you got to get involved, and your favorite hacks are still available. We're gonna go from thirty two to sixteen, starting. Yeah, the uh, voting's underway. Underway. It, yeah. So by the time you're listening to this, and you go uh, to comfortably smug. That's right. Go go to my profile on Twitter. It is pinned at the top, and vote. All right. All right. Well, you got to do all of that. Uh, And with all of that, we will come back with an awful lot more right after this. Americans for Prosperity has done it again. You're going to love this. Know how Biden's been running around the country bragging about Bidenomics and the media is doing stories on how the president has embraced the term? Well, guess what? Americans for Prosperity just bought the Bidenomics.com domain name. I can't believe the White House didn't get this first. This would be like Pepsi buying Coca-Cola.com. It's hilarious. Bidenomics.com sets the record straight on the failures of Joe Biden's economy, his horrible record on cost of living, wages, debt, deficits, energy, and more. I've been to the site. I can tell you, it's not what Joe Biden wants Americans to see. AFP takes Biden's own words and compares them to the reality of everyday Americans. It's packed with facts and stories that prove Bidenomics is a costly failure. Americans for Prosperity deserves a lot, a lot of credit for this coup. Visit Bidenomics.com soon, the website Joe Biden doesn't want you to see. All right, so uh, we promised you a good Corinne Jean-Pierre. Yeah, I wish we had Ashbrook here to do the I know, I'm trying my best, but that, like the, he does it. In a, Can I try one? Yeah. Corinne Jean-Pierre. Hey. Yeah, nice, I like that. <laughs> that is very, very... Very good. Uh, anyway, we all have to see her on news and whatnot, and everything's hilarious. What you didn't know is that the White House, when they're in campaign season, mm-hmm. deputizes basically anybody with a name that people would recognize to go do things like regional radio. Yeah. Right? So they get them on a play. All they're supposed to do is go on, you know, think about your, your news station. Right in D.C., it's WTOP. Where I grew up in Minnesota was WCCO. Like places that are not ideologically inclined, they just do news updates, weather, sports. They got a couple personalities, but it's not ideological in one no, way or it's another. It's like drive time news. Yeah. So that's what they've done uh, with Corinne Jean Pierre. That's good. Very good. Under thank you. Mm-hmm. I've worked on it a little bit. Um, and they put her on in North Carolina. And you got to hear this clip. Uh, can we get clip three, please, Spaghetti? Does the president have dementia? <laughs> so before I move on from that, does he? That, Mark, Mark, <laughs> I can't even believe you're asking me this question. That is a credibly offensive question to ask. But you know uh, people ask pres- it. Wait, don't let me. No, 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 no. You, Mark, you, 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 you took, you're taking us down this rabbit hole. Let me, uh, let me, uh, groceries, those costs have gone down because of what this president has been able to do. And, th- and with that, thank you so much, Mark. Have an amazing, amazing day. Wow. Wow. Oh. <laughs> the busy signal. I mean, Mark, this, this, you, listen, I am nominating you to get a press corps badge and you need to go to the White House. I'm sorry. I mean, <sighs> the busy signal. That's amazing. So, so what's so fascinating about this, it, it, it reveals a couple of different things. One, this is not a conservative talk radio host. No. This no. is a news guy. And they're asking the questions that they get from their listeners and he said every day. Plainly, he was like, "That's what a lot of people are asking," and it's true. Yeah, yeah. It, it is, and it's true. What's the call letters of this station? 
if you don't have it, we'll find it and let you know. But like, it's a it's a really broad mainstream audience. Mm -hmm. And what occurred to me with Corinne Jean Pierre here mm -hmm. is that they live in such a silo of information where it's a reaffirming point of view. Yeah. It was WBT in Charlotte. Yeah. Okay. Mainstream news. Mainstream news. Um, that this is this is an offensive. Like you don't have an answer for yeah. that question. This question is something that is like, you know, uh, Barack Obama birth certificate. Yeah. Or like, uh, you know, did Bush do nine eleven? Mm -hmm. And like, they're they're, despite the fact that the polls show that like sixty percent of Americans believe that he has dementia and they're concerned about it. Yeah, they, they don't have an answer. It, not only do they not have an answer, Josh, they also find a way to immediately r like raise it to the level of those other conspiracies Goes to 11. right like she says the rabbit hole and it's like there was no rabbit hole There's he simply no just hole. asked the it's a question. Flat question he asked a flat question in fact it's led our national discourse for the last month ever since he gave that uh address where he claimed things that were lies about what the spe special prosecutor said about a deposition he had to do. It's not a rabbit hole. It's been national fucking news. Like, you don't have to go to 4chan or Reddit to figure out if Joe Biden has dementia. Just turn on your television. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, so so, so the fact, the fact that she can sort of just try to push it away down a rabbit hole, like a conspiracy theory, reflects the point that you were saying earlier, that these people live in such a cloistered environment mm -hmm. where they're not exposed to tough questions for so long that they lose the ability to answer very easy, straightforward questions. You may not like it, but to your point, 60 percent of Americans believe this to be a fact. You got to have an answer to that question yeah. if you want to win re-election. Look, this is, the, this is the criticism I've had of both Republicans and Democrats in this era. And that when you have such a bifurcated media is a choose your news culture, uh, the easy interview is always the one that you accept because mm -hmm. you're just, you know, kind of like precipitating, surfing the wave that's already built. But when you don't understand that, like, at least 50 percent polls show up to 60 percent of America have a very real concern. And you're doing a mainstream r media interview and you don't have an answer for this. Like there's a funny way. There's a there's a congenial way of dealing with that. Yeah. In a if way that you were an actual like press secretary and someone who didn't get the job because you were the first, you know, whatever like nine check boxes. Right. You would you'd yeah. have that's like a very basic thing. Right. Ronald Reagan famously handled this so well in that debate that he Perfectly. had where he was like, I promise to not attack my opponent's youth and inexperience. Right. As he's you dealing know? with an elderly yeah. Walter Mondale. Yeah. I mean the, the, I guess the point is, like, imagine, dude, just imagine living in a world where you were so cloistered from any opinion that actually exceeds 50 percent of this country and then trying to speak on behalf of the American people. Yeah. Like, and, and, and she instantly goes back to the standard lip thing of when they're like faced with facts and, and actual concerns. They're like, oh, this is offensive. How dare you? Yeah. You know, like to try to make you feel like. You're a bigot or you're the bad guy because you're like, well, most people think he's got dementia. Does he? Because I get that question a lot. This, I mean, That's this, offensive. This, is the, this is the guy who does local radio, who talks to people yeah. constantly for a living. He is not trying to give you a gotcha question. Nope. He is answering. He's asking a question he has gotten from thousands of people over the course of doing his job. You may not like it, but that is reality. You have to have an answer for it. It's lib politics. Yeah. Right? It's, it's everything from this to everything they don't like is misinformation or Russia did yep. it. It's just they have found this way to rig the game in which there's this narrow bandwidth of discourse that's allowed yep. in their world and yeah. everything else is harmful. That's right. Or it's offensive mm -hmm. or it's a conspiracy theory or it's Christian white nationalists that are, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Anything yeah. other than what they want to talk about in the narrative that they yeah. have is somehow racist, sexist, that's exactly it. and yeah. everything else. That's it. I mean, it's but it's wild to hear. It's cool though. I love it. Oh, I love you? when they show I'm us who they are. Up now. Oh. The dial tone was so good. So <laughs> Unreal. Speaking of silos, we covered on Tuesday the episode that was former RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel uh, signing on as a paid contributor to NBC and the furor that that caused. And we played some clips from Chuck Dodd and Scarborough and everybody else. 
Well, about uh, 48 hours into her tenure, NBC decided to cut the tie mm. with Ronna McDaniel. And they have, uh, they fired her, essentially. Yeah. Uh, unclear whether or not the contract that she signed will be honored and that she's going to have to get paid one way or another. She sued the hell out of them. I yeah. mean, that's wild. I mean, they should have to pay her, for sure. But it does kind of like... Look, one of the things that has bothered me for a long time in this line of work is that when you look at corporate media, mm -hmm. and this is not new, this is not a Trump-era thing. You might think it is because you just tuned in or you just sort of like have become outraged during the Trump era or everything else. But there is one hallmark for corporate media in this era. If you work for CBS, ABC, NBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post, as a opinion analyst, um, presumably you're on there to give a point of view from a party that is not represented, right? I mean, you can go back and forth with Democratic stuff. You look back like 20 years and you had like uh, uh, Mary Madeline and James Carville yeah. that would go at it and they were a married couple and it was funny and they had different perspectives mm -hmm. and like but you just like we all consumed the information and thought it was great and for a long time that's what they did is find somebody who was genuinely representative of the republican party and the democratic party now if you look at like the nbc one i'll just pick on them for a second because and it's not them alone uh the people that they have, like I noticed uh, uh, one of our participants in the uh, Hack Madness had tweeted this out. Like oh, somebody was saying like they can't hire a Republican. And they were like, well, tell that too. And then named like four names. Yeah. All those four names endorsed and voted for Joe Biden in yes. 2020. Mm -hmm. Right. So like what's happened at all of these newspapers is that the only conservative viewpoint that's tolerated is one – that is representative of a conservative viewpoint that has shelved their conservatism for the moment, yep. at least, if not indefinitely, and decided to play exactly their game. Yeah. Right? They I mean, I, decided to be Democrats, like Max Boot. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. or uh, I mean, look. Jen it, Rubin, same thing. Jen Rubin was a, a Republican. Yeah, Michael Steele. The list goes on and on. I, I, I I mean, not to criticize the decision to go to NBC, but just like not just Rana in particular, but just like for Republicans who are maybe entering into these contractual deals with media's, you know, media publications. I guess like if somebody approached us and they were like, we love you guys, would love to give you a contract on CNN or whatever, whatever it was. I would immediately hire the agent for Kirk Cousins, <laughs> and that thing would be locked up, fully guaranteed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like like yeah. like the idea that you operate with people who operate in bad faith every single day, and we've seen it since the truth since That's the beginning it. of the Trump administration. Everything they did that was honest to God lies. Russia the, Gate or what, Russia like Gate and all this sort of stuff. Like, the idea right. that you can enter into con like a contractual obligation with these people without having that money as like a golden parachute is like I would never do it. I just would never do it because I don't trust them yeah. at all. Yep. You know, like you would have to get a Kirk Cousins deal fully guaranteed. If I blow my Achilles again, I'm still getting money. I'm still getting. Paid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no, I know exactly <laughs> what you're saying. I know exactly what you're saying. No binding arbitration. No, like, we're going to deal with these two parties. If you're a Republican, like, you are entering a pit of vipers. Yep. Well, just how about, I mean, look, so what they say is it's not about partisanship. It is. It is. But let's just play out their argument. Mm -hmm. It's about a commitment to the truth. And the problem they had was that she was a quote-unquote election denier. An election denier. Yeah. Okay. That's what they say. Um. Okay, so a commitment to the truth is really what these news organizations are after. And if they disagree with the viewpoint and how you arrive to it, so be it, uh, as long as the truth is something that we are locked in on. How do you describe the employment of, like, former CIA director Brennan? Bingo. For example. Yeah. Who engaged in a 
systemic deception of the American people that started with the Clinton campaign for a period of years and extended into cable news and cable news contracts where he said basically the wink and the nod. Yeah, that like, I've got information I can't tell I you. I know, but because I still have security clearance that, like... Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia was the deal, and that these guys, th this is all true. Or yeah. like Jen Psaki tweeting out that, uh, th this is during, while she was working on the Biden campaign in 2020, saying that experts agree Hunter Biden's laptop is Russian disinformation. None of it's real. Okay. You're yeah, lying to voters. Now she has her own show. I, I mean, this isn't just in, like, an NBC thing. I mean, Natasha Bertrand, who's in our... Hack Madness Bracket is one of the greatest purveyors of Russiagate disinformation, yep. made her entire career on it. I mean, so many people in the media won awards on this stuff that turned out to not to, not to be true. And she got a a, a promotion at CNN as yeah. a result. No right. punishment for any of these people. Truth tellers. They're truth that's tellers right. now. Well, so, I mean, that's my point, is yeah. that it's... It, it, to boil down to the first thing you said is it is about partisanship, because it is. It's, if it was about truth-telling with the benefit of retrospect, how do you deal with all the people who said, like, lock it up, put on your mask, keep your kids out of school, it's the right thing to do, science tells us we have to do it, and then in retrospect you see the damage that that has done to children across this country. Like, I understand it's a little different in that maybe some people felt at the time, because it was a 100-year pandemic, they, there was a something to do, but the 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 expertise espoused from people like Chuck Todd, by the way, mm -hmm. who has a big problem with the truth uh, in terms of how Rana expresses it, um, were the first ones to say that the people who were not being vaccinated, who were not wearing masks, who were trying to send their kids back to school were the problems yeah, I, in I, this country. I guess where I come down on all of it is like, like being wrong is okay. Like being wrong happens all the time. It happens a ton in media. There's no yeah. nothing wrong with that. Like have a little bit of humility. What I what I what I hate about this and the way that they're sort of singling out Ron and, and Republicans is the arrogance That's right. of these people to not recognize their own fallibility as people in media. It's okay to be wrong. But you know what? Get on there and say, We've been wrong too. Yeah. It's okay. We're all human beings. But no, it's just Rana was wrong. Rana was wrong. We've always been right. Yeah. It's just like like th that is just sort of like the arrogance of this that I think really leaves a bad but taste. But that's the in thing is mouth. like the the entire left is predicated and built upon a layer after layer of lies, right? Whether it's Russiagate, whether it's they can't define what a woman is. Like they have to have this vast constituency of deranged people marching in lockstep, and it's all built on a house of cards of lies. And so that's why if anyone is outside their silo of information, they lose it because they can't handle anyone challenging their viewpoints because then it's dangerous. Yeah. Oh, this is dangerous misinformation. Oh, my gosh, this is harmful. This could kill people. Don't you know that Russia rigged the election? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I also think this is a microcosm of our politics right now in that Rana is run out of the RNC <laughs> Because she's uh, not enough of a goat fucker, and she's run <laughs> out of everywhere else because she doesn't fuck it, or because she fucked too many goats. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Like it's it's just it's it's too, there is no meeting in the middle here. There is no expertise. There is no, no perspective. It's like teen ball, and like say whatever you will about Ronna McDaniel, she's certainly not one of those like an extremist Republican whose viewpoint is harmful to the ears of the viewers of NBC. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, it's representative of half of this country. Half of this country. Half of this country. Yeah. They're not interested in that. Nope. No. That's dangerous. Uh, it's just we're not in a, we're not in a good We're not place. in a good place. We're not We said this a lot on the show. Garbage culture. It's a garbage culture we live in. Garbage culture and I can understand why a lot of people have a lot of animosity about institutions in this country when you take a look at that. Uh, all right, we're going to get to the variety. Yes. Next on the program, right after this. Ready? So this one's up your alley, old man. Me? Yeah. Okay. This is an old man special, as they say. Uh, 
according to Axios, and we got to play. Can I just set it up with the clip? I'm yep. just going to set it up with the because I could describe it, but I don't think it's going to have the same sort of energy that I need with just what we see mm -hmm. in here. Okay, clip four. Afford the habit. I lost four million dollars in the casino in seven years. Four million dollars. Four million dollars. That seems like a lot. That's a lot of money. Yes. But I enjoyed every moment of it. Aren't you going to run out of money? No. <laughs> What a queen. What a queen. Boomer Central, yeah. right? So well, this, is a, this is a lady, for those of you who are the audio-only variety, where uh, she's sitting at a slot machine just pumping bucks into this thing. Yeah, I, I appreciate that she's in this interview, but at no point does that stop her from continuing to lose money. No, I mean, she she doesn't even really look at him. No, she's just continuing flinch. to She has them. sunglasses on inside the whole time, too. So she tells the guy that she's lost four million bucks uh, playing slots, and he's concerned about her financial well-being. She assures him that that's not going to be the case. Uh, the question that I would have loved to have heard in that interview is like, ma'am, do you have children? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Yeah. here's the thing is, so the, the way Axios, the way everyone tries to paint this is like, oh, man, boomers, they're the root of all our problems and whatever. Do, does she have kids to pass this money to? Why? Why? They've they built a hell of a country for us. Oh, you're going pro-boomer? I've always been. They, I've called them, and I will call them again. They're the greatest generation. They really are. <laughs> they're the backbone of this country. How much can they give? I see they what you're doing. They built a successful country where things work. I see, right? I see what's and happening. And now look what's happened to it. Now look what's happened to it. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? I, I, I saw the other day over 60% of liberal women have been diagnosed with a form of mental illness. And this is the like voting block for the Democrat Party at this point, right? This is the world we now inhibit or inhabit. We used to have it so good when these folks, during their time, when they were calling the shots, let her play slots. Don't they still? They're call still calling the shots. That's my. I mean, that's basically the my. The summer of love. All these rioters. Yeah. That wouldn't fly. Hulk. What do you during mean? During their heyday. So, for our newer audience, uh, we have had an ongoing bit in this variety program now, uh, multi years, where uh, the subject of boomers and what it is that they've done to our country and the leadership uh, have pitted. Comfortably smug against Michael Duncan. They're the most and attacked that's, that's group what in I'm this country. The well, boomers. Okay, so here's uh, the counterpoint. Um, I, I mean, the boomers have enjoyed the greatest economic growth in the history of mankind. That they built. The boomers during, have during caused. During their lives. They've caused the greatest economic uh, growth. Okay. They also gained um, a complete codlock on political power in the United States in their late 30s and early 40s with the election of Bill Clinton in 1992, and they haven't relinquished it since. <laughs> and our two candidates for president, our silent generation and Boomer, yeah. Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Vote for the Boomer. The, the, the next generation that's been totally suffocated a, out of getting any political power, Gen X, like some of like our 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 best politicians of that generation, I don't care will for be Gen X. I don't like them. They'll be approaching their sixties by the time they get a chance to be president of the United States. I mean, the I you know I mean my complaint on the Boomers is that they complain about the country the most, and they have been the ones in charge their entire lives, their entire lives. They've so essentially at this point, Boomers are entering or have entered retirement, right? They built this magnificent system uh, in this country. What? And now they're in casinos. They want to hang out. They want to play the slots. It says here in the Axios article, older Americans are among the happiest people in the world. Coming Why wouldn't in they be? Why exactly. wouldn't they be? Why it's wouldn't like, they be? It's like they get to look back on a life of success and accomplishment, right? And they want to play the slots. They want to have a good time. They want to reflect on what all they got done. I'd be happy about it, too. And it says also they're doing great financially. Why are they doing great why financially? Is it, why smug? is it now kids are demanding taxpayers pay for their college loans? <laughs> no one paid for the boomers' college loans. 
That's the thing is have, these have, people have built you, this country. Yeah, have you looked and at And they have built so much wealth. Have you looked at the cost of college? And now these kids just want to rob us all. Have you looked at the cost of college and how much it changed from the boomers? Why should why should I have the, to pay for Duncan I'm not always at, wants us to pay no. Duncan wants taxpayers to pay for college I loans don't. and me and the boomers are going to stand against that me no, and the boomers not me and the boomers no i just think i think the boomers got very lucky that they lucky. came up during it's not a lucky. time no, it's, it's just a, a matter of time highly which, skillful people highly skillful that they came up in a time in which college was extremely affordable that housing was extremely affordable relative to your yearly income that you are insulated from global competition because there were so many of these emergent technologies that came up during our lifetimes that didn't yet exist that they lived in a world in which you left the office at 5.30 and someone could call you your home phone, but you didn't have a computer in your pocket that determined what you could do with your life, that we live in a world with a lot more global competition right now. And so I feel for the younger people in this country who feel like they don't have a shot to be as rich as their parents or their grandparents were. And if you look at any of the that's economic such a sad, data... That's such a sad, If you look at any of the e- economic argument. data... If, no, bro, if you, that's like... Hold George on, Washington me, only had to like sail on boats, and now we have to deal with cars. Get over it, bro. This is America. Hold Everyone on, me, always kept going up until this generation, which is blowing it. Let me, the let me boomers add, are, no. are, are kings let me, hold on, and let deserve me add, respect. <laughs> let me add uh, a little bit of context from this article from Axios. Uh, researchers have long pointed out that old age is generally a lot better for you than you may think. Psychological well-being plays out over a lifetime in a U-curve, according to a widely cited study uh, in 2008 that typically starts high in the youth, plummets dur- in stresses of middle age, and then picks back up around age 55. Well, the U.S. is losing its U-shape. Younger Americans aren't doing very well right now. Rates of anxiety and depression and suicide have significantly significantly increased the oldest americans reported more social social support and were less lonely than young even when they had fewer social connections financially boomers are crushing it uh americans over 70 hold 30 percent of the country's wealth a record high share but make up just 11% of the population. They're, they're literally kings. They're crushing it. Uh, 80% of adults, 65 and over, own their own homes. That means that they were better protected from inflation, not dealing with rising rents. Of course, retirees also get a form of universal basic income via Social that they Security. Paid into. And they didn't that mention, they but I will add, Medicare. They earned it. They paid into it. That was the deal. They paid their part, and now these Did kids they? wants to pay for their college, they want UBI when they're in their 20s. Here's the thing is every generation tries to claim that they've had it the hardest. But what's here's what's really sad. So I saw this study that was done. Uh, I, I was reading this the other day where the rate of uh, people between like I want to say 18 to 21, the rates they showed on the graph by year in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s that have ever gotten their driver's license. That's been cut in half over the past 10 years. Yeah that have ever asked anyone out on a date has been cut into a third. Two, it's down two-thirds. It's because what has happened to society is everything is dangerous. Don't take any risks. Don't do anything. You know, Just do what's socially acceptable. Worry about pronouns. You don't want to offend anybody. You, you want to stay in this bubble wrap of safety and not actually trying to do anything. Boomers took on challenges. They built this country. Look at what, during the lifetime of a boomer, right, someone who's 70 years old, look at where they've come. The, a, a man on the moon, iPhones, all within the lifetime of boomers. That accomplishment during that time. And now what, 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 have, what have the youth of today done? With the boomers that they're demanding the we pay for their, that? that they demand? Or, or the man on the moon. The, the man on the moon got there in 69 during their lifetimes. Yeah, but you're it was telling the greatest me that generation. The, it was the greatest generation you're, you're, you're that went to the moon. It was Gen X it, that it, built boomers, the iPhone. Boomers made all of this happen. <laughs> Steve Jobs was a boomer. <laughs> he built all of this. No, right? he wasn't. So here's the thing: he is, wasn't. No, he, he, was, he was absolutely a boomer. Fact, well, More wasn't. lies from Duncan. Okay. We're not going to pay for college loans. That's Look, it. Look, no, I, I, I'm not going to. You can't I'm convince not going to speak to how great Gen Z is. Like that's not what my thing is. All I would say, I would hope for the boomers who listen to this to understand. Like I can just speak from my own generational experience as a millennial, and that is like. I was in high school during 9-11, and then I saw, you know, people I knew in, in high school go into the military, and they fought a long war 
in Iraq and Afghanistan. I graduated college during the Great Recession. And so over a, per- a very short period of time, you saw like a, a, a big change in American culture and our generation as we're entering the workforce. And they came with a lot of different challenges than a lot, I think a lot of other generations faced. Everyone's faced different ones, but it is very difficult to enter the workforce during the Great Recession. And then, you know, my generation got to an age in which you were accumulating the sort of wealth to buy a home, and then COVID hit, and we shut down the American economy. And there are a lot of people in my age cohort who lost a lot of stuff, who like lost the, you know, jobs they were working at or the businesses they built or the nest eggs. And so for a lot of these boomers who look back on that period of time and they're like, nah, we made it through. It's like the, the risks for my generation were a lot higher than yours, a lot higher than yours. And there's a lot of people who are still not recovering from that. Bro, there are boomers who are worried about getting polio, And those boomers did not sacrifice. Dude. Like, they sacrificed a lot. Those boomers did Boomer not sacrifice. Boomer death rates were so high. We closed They used to not have seatbelts in their cars, bro. I understand. I'm just saying, we, 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 <laughs> shut, down the country, we shut down the country to save their lives. Bro, and you're came, talking about and it came a, at the, the cost sniffles, of, and these it, people didn't have seatbelts. I and, uh, <laughs> used to be able to drink and drive in this country. I'm just saying, dude. <laughs> I, 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 and they smoke made on it. airlines. <laughs> like these, yeah, you could smoke on airlines. I'm just saying, we we shut down the country <laughs> to save their lives, and God bless them. But it wasn't them who had to wear a mask in nursery school. It was killing my, them. My it, son. It did. was killing them. Yeah, my it son. Did. Had, it was life or death because for the of boomers. That. So, so I just to wrap this up, and I think. Look, Good arguments here. The reason but I but you have, agree the boomers are good. No, right. the reason I have some boomers hostility right. is that the first generation of Americans that have politically speaking acted in mass to protect their own consistently over a period of time, and you know the best example of that is like Social Security, for example. Right. Where, you know, you're bankrupting a country based on a program that was set in place by FDR that, uh, you know, at least one time in the 80s, they managed to try to retrofit for something that was, quote unquote, modern. When you had life expectancy of 67, you're getting paid out at 55. Not that big of a deal. But all of a sudden, when your life expectancy is 90 or 87 or whatever the hell it is, uh, and your whole, like, it, an entire group, AARP, dedicated to representing seniors' interests, is about ensuring that other generations get shortchanged by your generation. Like, that's literally the political motive. They didn't do that. The boomers aren't robbing anybody. Well, the, no, no. The agreement was you that's pay exactly and you what get they did. No, Well, okay. Yep. The robbery is from the young people who wants to pay for their colleges, the young people who want open borders— all no, these I, entitlements for I illegals. Don't, I don't disagree with you. You're, so you're, he's creating yep. a false choice. You're, 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 he's creating you're, a false choice. The political movement, if we take care of our own, <laughs> I stand with that. Dude. No, that I, sounds good to me. Okay. All right. That's fine. But that's what they're, they're doing, All these too. youngsters want open borders and us paying for the colleges, and Duncan can't convince me that's good. Okay. It'll never well, happen. I'm not trying never. to convince you that. I will always stand that. with America and the boomers. <laughs> I'm just saying it is incredible in this country where we've not had the capability of having an argument about generational change of our country's finances based on actuarial tables like the free market does? No, can't do that. Like you can't you can't actually have a conversation about the fact that life expectancy is is increased 25 years and the system remains the same and therefore your children, you're listening to this, my children, everybody else have absolutely zero chance of getting any of the benefits that were promised, as you say, you pay in. That's right, and, and you get, and that's the government stealing from it. And they're they're robbing the <laughs> they're robbing the boomers too. I mean, it's, the it's, boomers are always the victim. All right, this smug? waste and spending on bullshit that our government does. I do. We th- could yeah, pay no, for it's, all. It's, it's all foreign aid. And, I think uh, that, all of it. That and, woman and in the casino is the victim. Yep, she's the victim. She's the victim. She's the she's the one that's yeah. that's being wronged by her government. I bet she's got some strong opinions outside of her own slots. By the way, yeah, I'd love to hear her views on the world. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that that's just I we just wanted to set up a little debate here. And Smug, I think you adequately expressed a full boomer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I all mean, the boomers will heroes. be very proud of you. But, yeah. And they should be. I yeah. will defend them to the death. Yeah, no, you've done that quite adequately. The media is great at distracting you from things you should actually be focused on. While the media was debating Taylor Swift, 
China, Russia, Brazil, India, and South Africa, basically half the world's population created BRICS. That's B-R-I-C-S, which is a massive economic alliance that's already talking about replacing the dollar with their own currency. The consequences of this could be dire, with your 401k accounts losing value if BRICS is successful. Why risk your personal savings? Diversify your financial future. Invest in the one thing that has proven stable for centuries, gold. From today's sponsor, Allegiance Gold. They've earned the highest trust ratings in the precious metals industry, and their relationships are based on integrity, expertise, and impeccable service. Go to protectwithruthless.com today or call 855-510-GOLD. Right now, get up to 5000 in free silver with a qualifying purchase. Don't rely on promises of ever-increasing stock values or assurances the economy will remain stable forever. Protect your financial future today. Protectwithruthless.com. That's protectwithruthless.com or call 855-510-GOLD. Mike Tyson, who's my absolute favorite. Like, I can, I can remember few moments of joy in my childhood more than the next Mike Tyson fight. My dad was like just a prince in figuring out back in the day when you had to like order from the cable company oh, yeah, yeah. something weird to put on your TV to get pay-per-view stuff. I mean, this is going to, speaking of boomer stuff, I mean, this is like, it's going to make me sound Back like I'm day, a, yeah. 150 I years old. Yeah, there used to be a day where it wasn't just there for purchase, like on... It wasn't the, digital. The, the, yeah. No, you actually had to put physical equipment yeah. on your television to get these things. And I would, I just loved him. I, uh, after I said on the show the other week that I would take a punch from him, if Jeff, Jeff yes, I will still take a punch from Tyson. <laughs> pay me. I went home and I watched a documentary on Tyson on YouTube. Bro, his fights are still electric. They're the best. I watch them almost. It's like throwing a stake in a lion's cage. Once a month, I watch a highlight reel from Mike Tyson just because it brings me back. Well, anyway, he's got a new deal. Uh, you know, things have not been terrific. He got kind of robbed during his uh, fighting career. Yeah, like, Don King. Yeah. He, Don King robbed him. He got, he got kind of robbed. And so he's been fighting through a bunch of financial things. You know he's doing a fight against uh, what's his name? The what, uh, Jake Paul? Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jake Paul. Jake yeah. Paul. Uh, so he's fighting as a 57-year-old man, which is just, like, unbelievable. It's brutal. But anyway, what he's also doing is he's making ear-shaped edibles <laughs> in New York. Can we get a graphic up on this for our YouTube audience? This, these are, e they're like gummy ears. Oh, they're only, it says they're only weed. I was yeah. like, if they're vitamin C, I'll take these. No, they're local weed shops. Uh, New York weed shops are stocking their shelves, and this is according to the New York Post, uh, with Mike Tyson branded edibles shaped like an ear. And that is a callback, obviously, from Mike Tyson's heavyweight showdown with Evander Holyfield when he bit his ear off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, by the way, Which is was wild. just an incredible moment, yeah. iconic moment in sporting history. Well, you should have stopped headbutting Mike Tyson. Yeah. That's that's also true, but yeah. also Tyson was past his he 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 he'd lost his trainer like a long time ago. He was off the rails at this point. He yeah. wasn't the same fighter. He wasn't yeah. the same fighter. He, but he it didn't was, have his evasiveness. It was in it was entertaining nonetheless. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But now he now he's figured out how to uh, monetize some of this, and he's selling pot ears. See, I wonder if Holyfield is going to try to get a piece of this. Like be like, you already it's got my a piece ear. Of this? It's yeah. my ear. It's my ear. You're selling. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. how many times are you going to get a piece of me? Yeah. Like, <laughs> At this point, it's crazy. But like, you know that Evander Holyfield is like a full-on Republican. Oh, really? Yeah, I heard he's a great dude. When I was at when I, in my stint at the Republican National Committee in two thousand five, uh, he came in and like was just roaming around our building and like shaking hands and talking to people. He's a massive dude. Can you? I mean, I mean, I just one look at him. Massive. I was like, dude. Holy cats! Yeah. I can't believe anybody would fight this. Yeah. Guy. I mean, just an incredible and a great fighter. Yeah. Great. I mean, that used to be that was a great era for boxing too. It really was. That was when boxing was in its heyday. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible the people that were coming up in boxing that time. You had Holyfield, uh, what was his name in Britain? Lennox Lewis. Lennox like, these Lewis, are there were yeah. a lot of very serious fighters. Great totally. era. Yeah. It really was. It I really think was. I think what's only fair is that you know we can get some lawyers involved here and figure out what percentage of Evander Holyfield's ear he bit <laughs> off. Yeah, it was like a, it was a, it was a minute, maybe 12%. Wait, did you see it? Did you look at yeah. it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, because <laughs> oh, yeah. it's a real 
Yeah. Peace, bro. No, it's a it bite. It wasn't a little clip. The best is he did it like he spit his mouth guard out in order to do it. Yeah. It was so cool. It was so very easy, intentional. Bro. So maybe a 12% deal. So get 12% of the profits from the gummies. I think it's only fair. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think that's fair. You guys want some animal news? Yes. Always. So uh, it turns out that we're doing a little bit better in bio warfare against animals yes. than we are in the physical warfare against animals. Every week we give you an example of how it is that we're being beaten in the physical warfare. But the bio side, according to the New York Post, some of the deadliest diseases to stalk humankind have come from pathogens that jumped from animals to people. And we've heard a lot about that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's like... Uh, the avian flu or like, you know, everything with COVID and everything else. Well, the viruses that caused AIDS, for example, crossed from chimpanzees. I don't want to the story of how that happened. No, we're not going to get into it on this program because we enjoy our <laughs> platform. Uh, but as a new study shows, this exchange has not been a one-way street. An analysis of all publicly available viral genome sequences yielded a surprising result. Humans give more viruses about twice as many to animals as they give to us. Good. Huh? Mm. Good. So, like, I, I guess the upshot is, like, to win the animal war, if, if you're sick as shit, like, you just go hang around the zoo. Yeah, just huh? go to the zoo. Yeah. It's confirmation that we have dominion over the creatures of the land and sea. Yeah. And that we're more resilient. It's why we've dominated this planet. I don't see them you know, operating off of, like, penicillin. Yeah. They, they can't administer a shot with hooves. So I, I, wanted, I wanted to see these numbers closely, but it occurred to me, so it's viruses, because, like, a point that I constantly bring up is, and one of the reasons I never want to have a cat in the house is, you know, cats give brain parasites yeah. to people. This, this through, is like an actual fact. Yeah, through their feces. Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, because you've got the litter box in the house. I've never and had a cat. cat marches around in there, and everyone's like, oh, this is my cat. He's going to jump on my bed. He's been like kicking his, sh literally kicking his shit around in the litter box. He's gonna jump on my bed. He's gonna put brain parasites everywhere. Well, now I would say is is that's much more prevalent among cats that are outside. Because you were a cat guy for a while. Well, my my wife uh, is cat family. I mean, they have cats. Do you still have a cat? No, no. You got rid of that one, huh? We L long needle. Was that, was that <laughs> yeah, long needle the cat? Oh, bro. no, no, I didn't long needle a cat. What happened with our cat? It's like if the vows are said, the cat goes down. <laughs> wait, 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 did it go like a, a a kitty litter pool? No. So what happened with the cat, and, and uh, you know, I'm not in particular a cat person, but what happened with the cat is that the cat came into the house early, like when Katie and I... I remember were, when you had this were, cat. ...were just married. Yeah. Um, and then came our dog, and then came our first son, and then... Katie was pregnant with our second son. It lost the seating. Yeah, the, the cat just got further and further <laughs> down in the totem pole. He's like, pole. writing's on the wall here, bro. <laughs> yeah. Just you know? open the door. And, <laughs> I'm out of here. And in that process, the cat had sort of radicalized. And oh, really? Yeah. And it, it got... So you had to kill it. You so it got so needle. bad. It got so bad. You know, the cat was like attacking my wife as she was like walking up the stairs. And she was like seven months pregnant. You put oh, it down, you know. Bro. So long needle. Well, so one morning, this is a good story. So one morning, uh, I was just sitting there uh, on our couch and I'm like having my morning coffee. I am so into this story. Yeah. Bro. I'm just Where's this breath. going? I'm, I, breath. I'm having my morning coffee. And I'm sitting there and... I get viciously attacked on my arm by the cat. The cup Out flies, of nowhere. flies directly into my face, hot coffee oh, on God. my face and my body and all over the cat. It's couch. justified at that point. And the, and, and the cat is sitting there on the arm of the couch, mouth open, teeth bared. Like hissing. Like Come at me, like bro. There's more. Like I like like I'm ready to like, get There's more where you that came this? from. And and I ship that cat to my father in law's house the next week. What? A fate worse than death. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to the in-laws. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you told your family, or is that actually what happened? That's exactly what happened. Is that what you told your family? <laughs> no, that's exactly because, what happened. Because, you know, you get, like, you know, my dad, it would have been a, a big thing about how the dog ran away. No, I mean, look, this cat, this cat loved me early on and was a great cat. I just think over time, the stress... That's the thing. Cats, more people cats, in the cats house. still don't ever love world? you, dude. They don't yeah. ever love you. Yeah. Cats will eat. It, it, this happens in New York when people like croak in their apartment and they no eat one's them. there. They'll eat them. The cat's the only animal is just waiting for you to die. 
It just wants no, to No, I eat. mean, there's such a huge difference. Dogs will, like, they'll lay by your side the yeah. whole time. They're like, and, I guess like, I'm starving to death with you, amigo. Lament your death. Uh, cats will eat your face. Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. Yes, correct. But it, also just the environment in which the animals are sometimes, is it's just not good for them anymore. You know? I mean, like, I'm sure your dog was different after your boys came. Well, it was old, and eventually, you know, it couldn't do what it yeah. was having seizures and stuff, yeah. so it got the long needle. Yeah. But like, but the cat, but the, <laughs> cat, the rule. but the cat, the cat haven't been, been you lose first. your entertainment factor. <laughs> Out you go. The cat haven't been first, and then like the dog comes, and then like the kids, and like the noise and everything. I just think like it freaked our cat out. Did you think for a second like I'm in a long needle? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would have, I would have done that before. If, it, if, that is, if the father-in-law wasn't gonna take it, was it long needle central? Yeah, I had to protect my wife from being attacked on the stairs while she was Dude, pregnant with my child. Now I know when you when you go to Duncan's house, his dog is so well behaved yeah. because he's like, "There's consequences under yeah. this roof." Yeah. This man, this man draws a hard line. Well, I remember there, the yeah. cat. The cat yeah. fucked around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the cat fucked. Her. The cat fucked around. Never to be heard from since. That's right. And the best part is like his, the father in law. His father in law comes up for like several days at a time. Nobody asks any questions about where the cat is. Oh no, the cat's actually thriving now. I don't believe you. No, I'm dead serious. So when we had the cat, <laughs> when we when we when we had the cat, like after Joey was born, he lost half of his hair. The cat did. Yeah, he was like getting really stressed out about it. It didn't like it, the additions. To you're the like, bro, you're stressed. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your stress, long needle would be just. I'd keep one in my pocket. At well, that you point. can understand why I was like close yeah. to doing it. I was like, this cat is not having a good life. <laughs> And so he's actually thriving now with my father-in-law. Like he gets to like be outside and he chases birds and stuff. At he actually loves it. At least as far it. as you know. Yeah, I mean it's totally it's not possible like you've he's been down and see it. No, it's totally possible he's been dead this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's he, not like you're asking for proof of life. No, he's already dead to me since that day with the coffee. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love it! Cat stories in the variety program. You get a little bit of everything here. Uh, we got into our interview, and our interview is with Moore Capito, a candidate for governor of the great state of West Virginia. I want to welcome to the program uh, a really good guy. Just got to know him here in the last uh, 25 minutes. But, you know, you're an impressive guy. I will say that. First impressions, man. Yeah, he com <laughs> comes from a long line of impressive people, and he's now a candidate for governor of the great state of West Virginia, Moore Capito. Welcome to the program. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you all having me on the program. Yeah. And I also do take note of the fact that you all say it correctly, yeah. like we do in West Virginia, the <laughs> program. <laughs> that's right. Is that, so that's a, that's a thing in West Virginia? 100%. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. good. I'm glad to know we're amongst good company there. Great company. Terrific. Well, so listen, uh, let's start a little bit about your background. Obviously, you have come you come from a political family. Um, so politics is probably a part of your growing up and I mean, just sort of part of the DNA of the Moors and the Capitos. It is, it is, but you know, honestly, and this is sort of the can, you know, but it really is true. It was sort of, it started as a, I think a, an appreciation of service, yeah. you know, I mean, West Virginia is sort of one big small town. And by the way, I'm, I'm here also on a recruiting mission to okay. all of those listening okay. to bring them to West Virginia and experience it, of course. Good. But, uh, you know, we are one big small town yeah. in West Virginia. So everybody sort of knows each other. Uh, and if you don't know each other, I don't know, what's Kevin Bacon? Is it seven degrees or whatever it is? It's about one in West Virginia. Yeah, one degree. Yeah, and we sort of laugh about the fact that, uh, and maybe even take it for granted sometimes, it doesn't matter if you're in, you know, Colorado or if you're in Australia, you see a flying WV on somebody's head. Mm -hmm. You're you know like, them. hey, you know, <laughs> you're from West Virginia? And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, I mean, my Uncle Jim. And you're like... You mean my eighth grade teacher, yeah. <laughs> Jim? Yeah, I mean it's really that small. So, but to get back to the question, uh, yeah, I mean it's 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 about service and it's about helping people. Yeah. And and honestly, whether you do it in 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 a in politics or whether you serve on sort of a board or a PTA meeting, uh, you'll find that in the state of West Virginia, there's sort of this support system that people really help each other out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everybody in the state tries to yeah. do it in a way that they feel can be most impactful. So what you're telling me is you're like one phone call away from getting Randy Moss on the horn. Uh, right? A half, probably. A half? A half. Yeah. You know? uh, how about this? Text away. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah. Wow. I yeah. love that. Well, listen, it's a great state, and I've spent uh, a little bit of time there over the years. 
complex politically. It's becoming a little less complex in recent years with red margins uh, obviously growing. I mean, when I started in this line of work, it was a deep blue state. Correct. And I think through the good work of, of you and people around you, your family, it's changed quite a bit. Oh, no question. I mean, I remember, you know, when, when uh, of course, when my grandfather served, <laughs> it was sort of like a Hail Mary, you know, to even for a Republican yeah. statewide to get in anywhere. And I mean, you know, for him to have completed three of them, that's, that's a pretty good clip yeah. right there. And then when my mom came onto the scene, I remember in 2000, you know, everybody's you know, managing expectations, yeah. like, yeah. look, like, this is probably, and, you know, you just kept chugging away. And I think what we found in West Virginia was uh, truly one of those sort of narratives mm -hmm. where the the National Democratic Party really left they West just Virginians. Yeah. And so the composition of our legislatures and things have changed. Yeah. Um, but I think the value set is probably the same, mm -hmm. which aligns so much more with the Republican Party, more and more as the Republican Party yeah. sort of transitions and grows, as all parties do. But um, yeah, 83 years until 2014, I mean, it was all blue yeah. all across all across the state. Uh, and then 2014 was the first time the legislature sort of flipped red. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really amazing. It's, it's happened incredible. quickly. Happened Very really quickly. quickly. Well, it started to build, you know, in the early 2000s under yeah. Bush. Bush carried... Uh, West Virginia and By like an eyelash, right? They spent, and everybody was spending time there. Yeah. You know, all the Republicans were trying to, because it was important, as we know, in 2000. I mean, huge. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, you know, those five electoral votes were, were critical. Um, and then sort of, I mean, the, so the wave, I suppose, started then. Uh, and then it just sort of, it, it increased. And then, of course, you know, there was a huge, I mean, there was a huge attack on our way of life, mm -hmm. which was the coal industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't subtle. No, I mean, no. It was like, it was very They're direct. Like, we want to no. put you yeah. out of work. We want to put you <laughs> and your families out of business and uh, deal with it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's disgusting, yeah. quite frankly. And folks just said, well, we don't want to be a part of whatever that is anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then you sort of started to see people vote. The yeah. way that they thought, and then you know, voter registration has sort of changed. It always sort of lags. It lags, you know? lags considerably. It we, does, Michael. We, yeah, we saw this uh, in Kentucky. You know, for the longest time, we had these sort of like blue dog Dems, you know, who are registered Democrats because that might be the only name on the ballot in their local race. Right. Yeah, they, but they local were local primaries. But they were culturally conservative people. You know, and so in 2014 was like the straw that broke the camel's back mm -hmm. and all these places yeah. in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia and places in Ohio. And I feel like we've just been growing there ever since. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. I mean, it, it was 14. And it, I think that was when, you know, that was the first senatorial run for my mom when mm -hmm. she came in. And then all of a sudden you just see this momentum in, in, in that midterm elect that last midterm election. It yeah. was huge. Yeah, it really it, was. It really went all through Appalachia. Did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's how you say it, by the way, Appalachia. Yeah, Appalachia. Yeah. 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 Oh, you don't well, have to tell us. We, we <laughs> hey, you guys are big on pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. so I'm just throwing my two cents in here, man. <laughs> We're real stick Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah. We're real stick it's, it's the diction. Yeah. Really. Yeah. You've got yeah. to make sure that you're yeah. precise with it. Well, I'm, I'm from Ohio, but I love West Virginia. Some, some of our people call it Ohio. Yeah, well, Ohio. I, some of our people call it Ohio. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, I love it. I Davis, spent some time in Davis, highest valley east of the Mississippi. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous country. And I know that you're crisscrossing the state, and I'm wondering, like, what are the top two, three issues that you're hearing about, you're talking about on the trail? Well, I'm glad to hear that, uh, you know, you've spent some time in West Virginia. It took him all uh, of about two minutes in the interview to get Ohio back into yeah. it. We yeah, that's like running, his thing. Running yeah. joke. With Here's him. my question. Why can't you all stay in the right driving lanes? That's what we're always asking. <laughs> this year they actually had a bill that was going to create a secondary effect fence for driving too long in the left lane, and it took everything in them not to name it the Ohio Bill. Um, but I mean, I'm not kidding. Um, but to your point, I mean, you know, you hear all of these things. I mean, you know, the issues that are in West Virginia are probably not unlike uh, those that are in uh, other states or across the country. As we see, politics has become so sort of, you know, nationalized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, those issues sort of, uh, sort of rise to the top. At the end of the day, you know, we've driven 70,000 miles across the state of West Virginia, been to every county, every region at least once. Um, and people want a good paying job. Mm -hmm. yeah. They want good schools and educational opportunities for their children. Mm -hmm. um, and they want a really good road to be able to drive back and forth on. And people 
don't we don't really talk about infrastructure enough. Mm. But in a state like West Virginia, where we have four, uh, you know, as our governor would say, rock solid seasons, mm -hmm. uh, you have deterioration of some of your infrastructure pieces that, um, you know, is critical to growth, but it's critical to lifestyle as well. And I mean, to your point, you spent time in Davis. I mean, that that is exemplary of you know, the, the sticky attraction that we talk about in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks, you know, we're all probably in the same ballpark maybe of age, I guess. But, you know, when we were kind of it was like, you know, get the pinstripe suit, live in the high rise, have a studio like this, you know, expensive <laughs> car, just get expensive cars and all of that. But we talk about, you know, what's been going on in the past sort of four years, this transition of what people really want in life and mm -hmm. so much more lifestyle based. Yeah. yeah. You know, people want, you know, space to move around, low cost of living, low density housing, optionality, you want to live on the mountains or in the wa near the water. Yeah. Um, all of these things that West Virginia really has. You got it. You got it in spades. In spades. Yeah. It's just so gorgeous. The only thing I don't like about driving uh -oh. in West Virginia oh, is go. that you got to keep your eyes on the road. I want to look everywhere but the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it is really hard to it's really hard to well, die. Well, he's from Ohio. So Especially in the, the I know yeah. I thought he was gonna say I really want to stay in the left lane, but I have to get back to the right lane. No, I'm just kidding. No, you're right. And particularly yeah. in the fall season when we get incredible leaves. I yeah. mean, people come in and tourism's been a huge boon for us, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, we had the second I think statistically we had the second highest rate of return on yeah. folks that had come to West Virginia. Uh, as tourists and mm. come back. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah, it's awesome. That's really great. Well, you also have to worry a little bit about all the people migrating out of blue states to places like West Virginia, right? I mean, it's like maybe a wall is in order just to preserve what you got. <laughs> Easy, Rachel Maddow. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I mean, we, uh, we, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, but I don't really think that's a big issue because I will say when I was in the state legislature, we were pretty um, intentional about uh, sort of sticking a you know our, our foot in the sand or drawing a line in the sand and saying this is where we are politically this is where we are culturally yeah. we aren't going to change that in fact we're probably going to double down on that which causes hand wringing a lot of yep. you know to a lot of the left but we said look yeah, this is who we, who we are, are. Yeah. and it's it's growing i mean mm -hmm. our in our in migration has been uh better than our out migration we just gotta have people have more babies than people dying but we'll, yeah. we'll get there um <laughs> But, you know, that trend line's pretty good. Yeah. No, I mean, really good. It is a beautiful, beautiful state. So tell me, you got this race going. You've been doing this for a little bit. 14, uh, 14 15 months, yeah. 14 months. Yeah, buddy. I mean, that's a real, you're going to meet a lot of people. You do. You do. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, West Virginia, by and large, some people say, well, you know, you have your urban areas. Like, we don't really have urban areas in West Virginia. <laughs> But there's a lot of rural areas, so you know you got to spend the it takes time. Takes a little while to get yeah, there. Yeah, and as we said, you know, we sort of joked before, and I, you know, when we announced at the end of November in 22, people, you know, geez, not again. But we wanted to make sure that we spend every single second we could uh, driving to every place in West Virginia, not to show up and start spouting off about how great we are, mm -hmm. uh, but to 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 show every West Virginian that we want to listen to their ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, because ultimately, you know, we're so tone deaf. I mean, we can talk about all the issues that we believe mm -hmm. are at the forefront of everybody's mind, but you'd be surprised when you actually get down, you know, and, and sit down at someone's uh, kitchen table mm -hmm. and figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a lost art. And no I, question. And I think it's overlooked in politics too much. That's exactly right. I mean, in order to develop a message that's resonant in fall of an election year, you're going to need to go talk to people and figure out what it is they care about beyond what everybody tells you they should care about, right? Exactly. And, and, and like I say, so West Virginia is really interesting. Um, we have the, the best people. Of course, I'm very biased. I'm a lifelong West Virginian. Uh, we have the best people. Um, uh, but, you know, our state is sort of so different, whether you look at sort of the regional economic challenge or, or topographical challenges, quite frankly. So it's not really a one size fits all. Like if you have a you know a, a very flat state or right. you know you're just a big farming state. There's so many different uh, regional interests. I guess is the way that you would put it. Uh, but the, the 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 I go back to that cultural and value set. I mean, it's really there everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in West Virginia. But you're not going to be able to understand those nuanced approaches that you need to take as governor 
unless you understand the region and the people that are working in that region and trying to make it great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the cultural component to West Virginia and us having spent a lot of time in Kentucky in particular, Eastern Kentucky, totally get that. And I, I think one of the things that we observed, and I'm curious about your thoughts about this, I mean, part of the reason why the cultural component has become, if anything, more important is because it's just under constant attack from the left. I mean, 100%. You mentioned the coal industry. It'd be, it's enough if you try to bankrupt everybody, but then they had you know time enough to tell everybody how much they hate them in the process and didn't like the way they lived their lives. Yeah, you know? I mean, hey, God, don't you know California's that way? Yeah. <laughs> that was our, I mean, that was our first... You know, one of the things that we talked about, you're exactly right, John. I mean, we talked about, uh, you know, in our first component of some of the ads that we were doing, we said, look, you know... I was the guy that drafted the bill to ban sanctuary cities in the state of West Virginia. And then you get all these people from the left to come up and say, well, we're not a border state. We don't have anything. I said, let me just tell you something. Go into these communities and talk to these people and listen to them. Yeah. And they will tell you what these drugs that, Mm -hmm. you know, that are coming into our country uh, are doing. We have a blessing in West Virginia that we probably have, uh, you know, a handful or more interstates that traverse the state of West Virginia, which we're very grateful for. It drives commerce and people to West Virginia. Uh, but quite frankly, along with that comes a lot of the nefarious yeah. activity uh, in the drug trade. Yeah. And so, you know, we ban sanctuary cities. We have zero in West Virginia. Uh, and what we're seeing is in all these other states, I mean, six million illegal immigrants across the border. That's insane. Wild. I mean, the public safety has been the huge piece that we've talked about in the campaign about I think is an economic issue. I mean, it's a moral issue, of course, yeah. to protect your communities. But, you know, be the state that can go out there to every other state in the region and in the country and say that West Virginia's got the safest communities in the country. Yeah. You can leave your door unlocked. You can leave your keys in your car. I mean, if you want to. Uh, well, you what, know, a but, nice, what a nice blast for them. That's like getting in a time machine. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, you don't I mean, have to worry about yeah. that kind of thing. Oh, it's great. Yeah. And then, you know, or walk to school. I used to walk, you know, to school and you know, best part of the day was leaving school, but at least like it was a celebratory walk home. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Right. right. Uh, but you can't do that anymore. I mean, I drop my kids, you know, right at the door every yeah. single day. So we really talk about being able to claim the banner of having the safest cities in the country. And given West Virginia's proximity to you know, here in Washington, uh, you know, you got Loudoun County, you got Pittsburgh, you got mm-hmm. Columbus, you got Charlotte, um, all of these places uh, that people want to go to more and more sparingly mm-hmm. and yeah. spend their time in more of a lifestyle focused environment to raise their kids. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's a great pitch. Yeah. It's a I mean, sticky it's a, proposition. It really is. And I, but, you know, you boiled this down in a way that it, it I, I don't know why we can't have more conversation about that because clearly it improves everything in your state once you give some assurance to your public that things are safe. Things are, we're enforcing laws here. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? I mean, I was I was just out here and I was talking to uh, somebody earlier and they said there's two shootings in their neighbor and they're like, yeah, they're just not doing anything to them. Yeah, no, they didn't. And no. they're like, well, we don't have any rooms in the pr- prisons or something. I said, we'll build more prisons. <laughs> yeah, that part I mean, we, we can just, figure out. I mean, for, and I talked to a law enforcement officer uh, probably a year ago in north central West Virginia, and he's saying, for some reason these days in law enforcement, we look at two houses and we say, well, how can we help the bad guy instead of how can we protect the good guy? Yeah. You know? Uh, it, well, it's backwards. It's it completely backwards. Yeah. And that's what sort of the left's been pushing all across the country is that, you know, we need to, well, let's not forget about the people that get up and go to work every day or retired and went to work every day. Yeah. I mean, those are the people that are paying taxes and, you know, contributing to the, to the community and want to make it better. Mm-hmm. Let's give them something back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which we did, which I have to tout. Okay. And the largest tax cut in the history of the state of West Virginia, I was proud to lead on that. We got ourselves below Virginia. I was just telling them that yesterday. But, you know, that's something that we got to do. I a mean, limited government conservative right here and in person. <laughs> now, if you just built a bullet bullet train from West Virginia to D.C., then, yeah. then we could all move there well, and we'd be fine. The problem is we'd, the riffraff would come Yeah, that's right. be a one-way. He doesn't want a, no. a bullet train from here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want any. You don't want any part of that. Hey, we love bullets in West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that right now, buddy. Uh, that's part of the crime uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. platform. Yeah. I, I wanted to touch more specifically on the issue of, like, fentanyl all in the opioid epidemic and i know west virginia has been a place that's been hit really mm-hmm. hard by this you know i know you know obviously 
immigration sanctuary cities uh, is part of uh, you know the solution is, is is you know cracking down on on some of those nefarious actors that are coming across the border, drug interdiction, like like what is like a holistic whole plan you know, to combat this crisis look like for the people of West Virginia? So number one, it's been sort of a moving target. When I came in in 2017, you know, we were always, I mean, methamphetamine seems to be the thing that is the constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But really the problem initially was with prescription abuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I asked doctors, you know, two to three years later after we put legislation in place and, and they said, that's pretty much all gone. So you fast forward three years from that. Then you got heroin all over the streets, yeah. and people mm-hmm. are using heroin because they can't get, you know, the, the others. Um, and then, you know, crack down on that, and that goes away. So then this drug called fentanyl and mm-hmm. the derivatives thereof start popping up everywhere um, and killing people. Yeah. And and the 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 so I, I make that point for for a couple reasons. Number one is it's sort of a moving target. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you're you know, just when you're pinning something down, you know, you don't ever want to be chasing. We need to start Wayne Gretzkying, you know, and going to where the puck's gonna be. Yeah. yeah. But it's really hard to predict with some of these synthetic drugs that are coming online. And the big problem with fentanyl, and I know your question was what is the problem, what's the solution? But the big problem with fentanyl is it's being infused into everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, before we know it's going to be in Cracker Jacks or something. Yeah. I mean, it's it's literally, it's not just somebody, you know, taking fentanyl. It's what they're taking it with some other sort yeah, of Yeah, it's mix- not a fentanyl right. pipe. And yeah. it's, it, it's a mixture. So, uh, but one of the biggest pieces to that, and I know you referred to it, but, you know, supply is so huge. I've, mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many grandparents uh, and kids that have lost parents, grandparents that have yeah. lost grandkids mm. and kids for that matter. We have a ton of grandparents that are raising their kids' kids mm. uh, in West Virginia. And what we're seeing is that it's cyclical. Mm-hmm. And it's cyclical in the sense that folks that sort of bring these drugs into our community get arrested, they go away, and when they get out, they come right back to it mm-hmm. because they're making good dough and they don't really know anything else. So, I mean, if, if we're going to let people continue to come into our communities and suck more and more people in. It's a supply. It's a supply mm-hmm. problem to me. So we got to cut supply, which means growing our law enforcement, getting them the training and the equipment that they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got canine units that are growing. Actually, I learned about one of them in Shinston, West Virginia yesterday. Amazing what these dogs do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so really cracking down on the supply has got to be a huge thing. But the other part of it is, is economic. Yeah. You got to grow better paying jobs and opportunity for people to, you know, to be able to go to work. Yeah. yeah. Because we all know that work's more than just a paycheck. There's yeah. dignity in that. Right. We um, learned we learned a lot about this during COVID, right? With all the deaths of despair and people feeling like they didn't have a way out. Yeah. No question. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, it's nice to hear from a guy who's actually got uh, some thoughts yeah. on critical mm-hmm. issues. Yeah. <laughs> it's not not like an inch uh, deep and a mile wide. you got some depth on all this stuff, and you've done a lot of it. Well, it's a critical time in West. I mean, we really have an opportunity for explosive growth. We just need a new generation of leadership. Mm-hmm. We've got a governor that's sold the state great, mm-hmm. and we need somebody to take it to the next level. And I've got the energy, experience, and grit to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's great stuff. All right, i got three questions for you. You ready right, for these? shoot. If you can plan your last meal on earth. What would it be? Thundering herd from Tudor's Biscuit World. <laughs> <laughs> that was a test. Have you guys had Tudor's yet? No, no. not that's yet. That's the correct answer. Sounds like we got to go there. Correct <laughs> next, <laughs> next. That's the that is the correct answer. That's not the <laughs> so uh, next time you go to West Virginia, you got to hit Tudor's Biscuit World. Yeah. Okay. Take have anything you want. You want a Mary B, a Mountaineer, a Mine, or whatever you want. Yeah, I'm going Thundering Herd. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Sounds okay. like you got to order the menu. Where do you go? Where? They're all throughout West Virginia, oh, so it's a, okay. it's a West Virginia sort of. Oh, it's a chain. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Yeah. okay. Kind of like your your uh, spaghetti with the. Okay. What's what's the thundering herd though? What's that? Sausage. Okay. Egg, cheese, hash brown, all on a biscuit. About that big. <laughs> oh okay. man, sounds, I'm in. Right. It sounds, sounds good. fantastic. That sounds pretty like, good. I like it. All right. So this next question, uh, you know, you're a fairly young guy, so you know you're gonna have to think about this for a minute. But our question is. If you weren't doing what you're doing, and you never got into public service in the first place, but you have this whole blue sky part of your life that you could do absolutely anything with, with the benefit of retrospect and kind of knowing what your life has has become, what would it be? And it can be absolutely like Ted Cruz said he wants to be a power forward on, in the NBA. Like that's not a practical answer, but that's what he you know. So he could be like literally anything. Okay, dreamers, right? I mean, 
I don't know if it's just tis the season or what, but I mean, greenskeeper at Augusta National. Oh, yeah. there you go. I mean, <laughs> there you go. You hit our Come soft on. spot there. There yeah. you go. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Those people are magicians. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. why do they go by code names like greenskeeper? I don't know. Things like that. <laughs> <It's, They're, laughs> like, just call yourself what you are, King. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Come on. I mean, you, you can watch the whole broadcast for four days and never see a pine cone on the ground. Unbelievable. It's like they're like ninjas. It's a wild. It, yeah. Like deal. if it, like a pine cone falls, they like catch it and they run off camera. <laughs> I don't. I don't know, but it's just the most pristine place in the world. Like it's little incredible. gnomes and leprechauns. They got something. Yeah, yeah they got oh, something. So close. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I can't close. wait. I can't wait. Um, all right. So the third question. Our view is that most successful people are motivated by one of two things: either the thrill of victory, or the agony of defeat. And it's not that anybody doesn't enjoy winning, or they you know don't. Lo- loathe losing it's what motivates you to get to the next level right and the, the classic example of the agony of defeat person is michael jordan where like every championship he ever won he celebrated for like three and a half minutes but mm-hmm. like if you insulted him on the way to the court he wore it like a backpack for the rest of his life right the other side I, it's kind of like there's a bunch of historical figures like this but in sports let's stick with the master stuff it's like a phil mickelson mm-hmm. right he takes the two iron out when you shouldn't hit two iron because he thinks he can do it Mm-hmm. You know yeah, what I mean? I'm hitting driver. <laughs> I'm hitting right, driver. Right. So uh, that's the kind of the two poles. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing that came to mind was, you know, obviously Jordan. I yeah. think that I'm probably a person that, uh, you know, I hate to lose more than I love to win. <laughs> yeah. There you go. But that motivates you, you yeah, know? It does. I mean, they're so close to each other, though. You know, we pretend yeah. like they're sort of two completely different things, but that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me it, even a little bit. Uh, you've got, <laughs> you got good company on the show on that in that regard. Listen, if people want to help out your campaign, yep. where do they go? Come to morecapito.com. Read about us. Check us out. Be sure to absolutely donate yeah. to More Capito uh, for governor. Um, and when's the primary? May 14th. We are in a perfect position right now. Okay. May neck 14th. Neck. Well, you've got... Spread uh, to the finish, right? Yeah, what, yeah. like six, seven weeks? I mean, it's coming down to Yeah, it. it is coming down. It's 50, 50 some days. Yeah. Yeah. Not that you're counting. After it's 14 months. On, it's on my daily agenda every day. Somebody said, what is that number? I was like, that's days until the election. <laughs> because, hey, look, I, I was the guy that, you know, in the state championship basketball game, you know, jumped through the, the scorer's table. And I was like, that's what we got to do to the finish line. Yeah, we got to right. jump. <laughs> yeah. We got to tear it down. Yeah. Were you like also the wedge buster on the football team? No, defensive back and wide receiver. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, so there's some skill yeah. set there. Yeah. Yeah, it's got nice soft hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was more of a pick six guy. God, yeah. <laughs> you know, nice. Ball hawk. Everybody, everybody needs a good D bag. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you for coming in here. We're gonna we're gonna follow up. We'll keep uh, tabs Appreciate on what's that. happening. You're welcome to come back anytime. Thanks for having me on the program. Of course. So look, this guy's a good dude, and I, you know, it's a good program to do this interview because I think generational change has been a little bit of a thematic here. Young guy clearly in tune with what young families in West Virginia are dealing with. You know, there's a massive generational change there that happened um, with a solidly blue state turning into a red state and understanding that Democrats are coming after not only their livelihoods with the coal industry, but their culture as well. And they hated them. I mean, that's not too strong to say. Mm -hmm. Like the liberal left hates people from West Virginia. That's right. And this is a guy who's grown up in the era where he's watched that change and he's going to stand there and stop it from happening. I think he's got a pretty good pitch, don't you, fellas? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, to actually discuss issues that matter to Americans. What a radical idea. Yeah. Like, I don't know if crime. I mean, dude, it, it, when he was talking about how you can, like, leave your door open. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's, that's, dude, that resonates. Oh, that's I mean, it. I remember that as a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, what a wonderful time. It'd be nice to be in a place where you didn't have to worry about something like that. Mm -hmm. I think everybody feels that way. Anyway, uh, more Capito. Fellas, it's been a a wild week. Uh, I know that at the beginning of the week, uh, our intention was to ruffle some feathers with the TPUSA thing. Uh, We had an awful lot of input here. Uh, I would say the vast majority of it was like, thank God somebody said something. Uh, and for those of you who had a different opinion, I just want you to know sincerely, and I mean this in a heartfelt way, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> and I really don't. Like, we're going to tell you exactly what it is that we see happening. And if we think that there are resources being wasted in any way within what we see as a 
literal existential election for the American people, we're going to talk about it. So if you have a problem with it, I'm sure there are other options for you. Anyway, I think we did it. I think so. Absolute banger of an episode, gentlemen. Thank you so much to our guest, Moro Capito. Thank you so much to our dear listeners. Reminder, if you have not yet, subscribe on YouTube. It's more fun with video. So until next time, Indians, keep the faith. Hold the line and own the libs. We'll see you on Tuesday. Stay ruthless. <laughs>